Well, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Welcome to the Georgetown Global Virtual FinTech Seminar Series. Uh, my name is Alberto Rossi. I'm an Associate Professor of Finance at Georgetown and Associate Director of the Georgetown Center for Financial Markets and Policy. Today, uh, the center, in conjunction with the Ripple University Blockchain Research Initiative, is delighted to bring together scholars to present their machine learning related research. We have three fantastic papers. We're going to start with the uh, Alpha Portfolio for Investment Economically Interpretable AI, presented by Will Song. We're then going to move over to Forest Through the Trees, Building Cross Sections of Stock Returns, presented by Svetlana Brigolova. And then we're going to finish with um, uh, Leah Stern presenting Selecting Directors Using Machine Learning. So the speakers will have 20 to 25 minutes uh, to present the research and they will be not interrupted. And we will have then five to 10 minutes for questions at the end of the presentation. Please raise your hand or use the chat feature to ask questions. I'll be the person handling the Q&A. And uh, before getting started, let me just thank Anna Cormis and Rina Agarwal for, and John Jacobs for making the uh, event possible. And now I'll turn over the baton to Will Song, who's be the first presenter. He's gonna be presenting the paper, Alpha Portfolio for Investment and in Economically Interpretable AI. Will, you have 20 to 25 minutes. Thank you, Alberto. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. I'm just going to share my screen here. Let's see if that works. Okay, now you should see the uh, full screen here. Okay, well, uh, great honor to be here. And uh, today I'm going to uh, uh, talk about my uh, joint work with uh, Ke Tang from Tsinghua University and Jingyuan Wang and Yang Zhang from Beihang University. Uh, Jingyuan and Yang are actually from computer science department, so this is very much an interdisciplinary uh, piece of research. Um, the title of our paper is Alpha Portfolio for Investment and Economically Interpretable AI. Even though it sounds uh, quite uh, trendy, but what we look at is a uh, age-old classical problem in financial economics, that is uh, portfolio management. Um, what we do know is traditional portfolio uh, management approach uh, involves two steps. The first step is about estimating the distribution or moments of uh, return distribution. Uh, and the second step is either we take the Markowitz uh, uh, path of uh, mean variance optimization or uh, in practice many uh, traders do characteristic sort based on uh, some estimates and then do uh, I, I would call a little bit ad hoc uh, weighing, uh, either equal weighted or, or value weighted, so on and so forth. But we do know uh, due to the lack of long time series, um, you know, from Martin 1980 onwards, um, and, uh, and, and also uh, the, the fact that we just don't have many long tail events, uh, return is hard to estimate, variance, covariance uh, matrices are uh, usually not very stable or invertible. Um, there are many traditional uh, fixes to the problem, uh, but even those um, achieve very moderate success um, just because uh, of the nature uh, of the problem. Um, what we want to take here is really a different approach. We want to directly optimize the portfolio. So, so by definition, it's not going to be a general equilibrium model. It's not going to give you the uh, pricing kernel and all that, um, but the goal is to uh, uh, achieve a uh, portfolio performance. And we are not the first one to do this. Well, uh, there are several studies by uh, Brent and co-authors who have looked at the issue before. They want to get to the optimal weights of assets in the portfolio directly, uh, either through a non-parametric approach or parametric approach. Um, but the parametric approach uh, is still uh, prone to misspecification and non-parametric approaches uh, limited in the sense that um, you know, the, the model can only reliably implement non-parametric estimators uh, up to two predictors uh, in their earlier work. So we want to take a data-driven version of that. The underlying assumption is really the relationship between portfolio weights and predictors um, is less noisy than that between return moments and predictors. And by getting rid of the intermediate step of estimating the moments or return distribution, 
uh, we are also subject to less misspecification of the intermediate model or return model. Um, and uh, why, why would this work? Well, th think about how we construct a portfolio. If I estimate the first moment, so suppose I'm constructing a long only portfolio. The first moment of an asset is, suppose I estimate that very accurately, it's really negative. It's not going to be in my portfolio. So rather than using the statistical powers to reduce the pricing errors of this asset, uh, and by, by introducing or uh, by finding the right kernel to use, uh, we may as well uh, focus on the assets that I'm going to include in the portfolio and really estimate their higher moments uh, better in order to reduce uh, variance of the portfolio, for example. Okay, so um, th this direct approach is going to be a uh, reinforcement learning based. It's essentially dynamic programming. Once we see the model, we'll, we'll uh, get a sense of that. Um, so that's, that's one thing we want to do. We didn't do it in the paper and I probably wouldn't have time to touch on that. There are uh, further extensions which are related to how we can incorporate dynamic learning and dynamic budget constraints that are related to robot advising. Uh, but that's another benefit of using a reinforcement learning approach to the problem. Um, this, the second kind of uh, line or uh, contribution we want to make is really to illustrate the utility of um, cutting edge AI or deep learning models in finance. We know uh, there have been um, m much advance in AI and machine learning and, and their applications in finance. Um, we can roughly label them under either dimension reduction or um, in a semi-parametric or distribution free approach to the problem. Uh, but we are typically still in a two-step approach. The goal there is to um, estimate the risk premium, uh, find the right pricing kernel. Um, it's not directly optimizing the portfolio uh, performance in that regard. Uh, recently, there are several uh, applications of uh, a neural network approach, but it's still within that framework. Um, what we want to do is to take this new approach and uh, we also don't want to pull statistical packages directly without, you know, tailoring it to our particular application. So uh, if we think about the data generating processes in sciences are very, uh, or engineering are very different from social sciences. Um, in finance, we know uh, the data that we have to share high dimensionality, non-linearity um, that uh, science data also face. But at the same time, our signal to noise ratio is really low. And uh, studies have also revealed there are uh, important interaction effects rather than the sparsity problem that computer scientists typically face. Um, in this study, what we want to emphasize in addition is really the kind of the fast dynamics of the data generating process. Um, our genes, uh, physical laws don't evolve uh, at very high frequency, but policies change all the time. Uh, you know, uh, investors' uh, preferences, risk aversion might evolve over time as well. So historical data in that sense is not really historical data. Uh, so we need to teach the model uh, how to learn with new data that's coming in. And that's why we're um, taking this uh, uh, AI model and build upon it. Um, and we're also facing panel data where we have multiple assets. So, you know, if we look at the machine learning and AI models uh, developing computer science, it's typically for machine translation, you know, computer vision, it's a single sequence learning. And by sequence learning, uh, it's essentially a neural net version of uh, our traditional time series uh, econometrics. Uh, but we face multiple sequence learning, so we have to make adjustment to that. We also want to demonstrate that um, our findings are robust to economic restrictions, and um, we want to interpret the model. Um, so um, that's, that's where we want to come in and make a contribution. There are papers in computer science that use reinforcement learning um, to, to uh, look at finance problems, but typically um, the researchers um, are not focusing on, you know, the economic motivations, restrictions, and interpretation of the model. Okay. The second half of the paper is really now, suppose we have this model that works great, this, this alternative approach to portfolio management that, that seems to work well. Um, it's a black box. 
we don't want black box. We want to understand the economics uh, of, uh, of the model, of our approach. So the second half of the paper is really devoted to developing procedures to interpret, to distill the model, to figure out what are contributing to the uh, model performance uh, if there's our performance. So this is very much related to uh, interpretable, interpretable AI in computer science. Um, the difference is uh, over there, um, the studies either use feature importance analysis or construct surrogate models. And we are the first one to take a hybrid. I'll be more specific on what we, we do here. Um, uh, basically, we use uh, two approaches. One is polynomial sensitivity analysis. The other one is textual factor analysis. The basic idea is just to project the black box model onto a linear, uh, linear regression model space. We can put in higher order terms, but, but we can uh, use the feature importance analysis to figure out which features are important, put, put their uh, higher order terms, and interaction terms into a linear framework. The textual uh, factor analysis is projecting the model onto natural language space in hope of looking at the words that correspond to you know, the portfolio uh, selecting uh, uh, certain stocks to take long positions versus short positions. Um, it, does that correspond to uh, what the firm is discussing in their disclosure? So hopefully through interpreting the natural language, we can, get, we can gain some understanding and narrative of the model. Okay, so um, these are the areas that we hope to uh, add to the literature. Um, so uh, with that, um, I'm just going to start on the model. But one thing I want to emphasize is, you know, our key contribution or our emphasis is really not on the fine tuning of the parameter or, you know, some people might say, well, uh, you, your model is so complex when you have so many degrees of freedom, of course you're going to do better and all that. Uh, that's not always true, right? We, we look at all the sample tests, we need to guard against um, model selection bias uh, and the like. Um, so, so that's not where we are adding the most. Uh, what we really want to contribute is this approach, this direct optimization approach. And hopefully I can convince you the choice of this particular AI model is very much motivated by what we need to do. Right? If we are maximizing, let's say, the sharp ratio of investors, uh, supervised learning, traditional regressions are not going to work. Uh, there's no right or wrong sharp ratio per se, right? But reinforcement learning is very natural. When we get a high uh, sharp ratio in the training set, we provide positive feedback to the model. So that it's going to explore parameter regions where they might have the highest gain in uh, model performance. And hopefully all these uh, would become less abstract when we come to the model, okay? so. So here is what I plan to do. I'll talk about uh, model methodology and show its empirical performance uh, before I touch on uh, economic uh, distillation, the interpretation part. So this is the model. I don't think given the time constraint, we're going to fully comprehend what we are doing here. So let me just break it down into a few steps. The model we use is a transformer. Uh, that's the latest uh, sequence uh, learning tool used in machine translation and computer vision, and also self-driving cars. Um, so what do we want to do? We want to use neural networks to represent the SS information. It could be financial ratios, it could be market signals. Um, and in our representation, we know we're facing panel data. Uh, past dependence, history dependence could matter. So that's why we want to use sequence learning. As er early, uh, earlier sequence learning models such as RN um, suffer from uh, certain technical uh, issues and limitation. So basically uh, the, the candidates we have are long short term memory and uh, the latest one is transformer. So we do both uh, in today's presentation, I'll only report what we find with transformer um, because that turns out to guard against certain uh, gradient explosion problems uh, that computer scientists have identified uh, uh, better, okay? So here's what we do. Um, for each asset, if I label it by uh, I, um, I'm going to look at a certain uh, window of their features, such as uh, book to market ratio, their 
earnings growth, but whatever future we have in mind that we feel are relevant, we're going to put it there and using XI to represent it. And then we're going to go through this transformer encoder uh, to further compress the information or embed that into a neural network. Um, I have to skip the details there is the uh, standard uh, neural, neural networks transformations, linear plus the nonlinear parts. Uh, but in the end, we basically have a um, matrix representing um, the asset I over time, their features represented in a vector space. That's what we get in this R. Okay, so that's that asset alone. What we add to the model, transformer encoder, is really a cross asset attention network. The idea is okay, I have representations of a time series of information for the asset. Now, suppose I introduce some parameter matrices, all these W, query, key, and value vectors. So far, there's no economic meaning to it. It's just matrix multiplication. But what I want to do is, okay, I, I have a really flexible uh, setup where I introduce these matrices. I'm going to have them multiply the uh, time series uh, representation of the assets and then Look at cross asset relationship. In machine translation, there is something uh, similar, which is self attention. Basically, looking at the earlier sentences of a passage versus the later sentences of a passage and take their dot product once we represent them using uh, vectors. And uh, I haven't told you why we do that, right? But that's just the operation we introduced for a moment. Because these operations is going to allow us to generate what we call a winner score. And uh, the, the formula shown here is the self-attention kind of uh, function that we typically use. Um, and uh, th the goal is to generate some numbers that captures interactions of assets as well as their time series representation. So far, there's no economic meaning to it. It's just representing the information, okay? Oh, and, and this is basically what we have for each uh, T stands for transformer encoder that represent the time series. And by doing, oh, putting on top of that, the cross asset attention network, what we're going to generate is a scalar product. That's something we call winner score. Why do, do I need this winner score? I'm going to rank the assets based on winner score. I'm going to long the, the top rank ones and short the bottom rank ones. Now, if I just blind, blindly run this, I'm going to perform really badly because there's no economics to it yet. I haven't trained the model. I, I didn't specify the model based on economic reasons other than the input features that are you know, relevant, uh, or at least we traditionally believe are relevant for uh, asset uh, returns and portfolio performance. This last step, training the model using reinforcement learning is very important. So uh, what is reinforcement learning here? It's basically a dynamic programming approach. We acknowledge the world is too complex. We are not going to be able to fully estimate the distribution um, of asset returns very well. So what we want to do is really like a child learning how to use a remote control. We're going to let the child try some buttons. If they see cartoon channels, maybe not their best or favorite channels, they are going to explore the buttons in that area more until they gradually learn through dynamic interaction with the environment how to uh, operate a remote control here is similar. We set up a really flexible model that generates portfolio, uh, portfolios based on the winner score. It's going to suck at the beginning if I randomly initialize the parameters. But as I train the model, when I get a high sharp ratio, let's say sharp ratio is my metric for performance, um, I'm going to give a thumbs up. That's positive feedback. If it performs poorly, I'm going to give it a thumbs down. And then the model is going to explore parameter regions that are going to give me high sharp ratio out of sample. Okay, so that's what a reinforcement learning implementation of the model is. Um, the, 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 the numerical approach for the model to converge is um, a standard from uh, uh, Berto Sutton's uh, reinforcement learning book, so I'm going to skip that part. Now let me just show you some uh, performance, empirical performance of the model. Uh, we look at uh, US equities. 
for illustration, Datasaurus is very standard. We train the model pre-1990 uh, until the model converges. We test the model from 1990 to 2016. We do allow monthly update of the model. So it's a rolling test. We also look at the subsample post-2001 after many changes in the market microstructure, so on and so forth. The input signals are uh, very similar to what uh, Framberger and uh, uh, co-authors have in their non-parametric approach. Um, basically, the inputs fall into uh, a, a few categories, uh, investment uh, you know, signals, uh, quality signals, value signals, trading frictions. And we also lag it by 12 months. So it's 12 times 51 characteristics. That's our input uh, feature. For the textual part, textual factor analysis, we use uh, firm's filings. Okay, so here is a key table from the paper. This is the performance uh, of alpha portfolio on the test set. Uh, in terms of sharp ratio, uh, return, um, turnover, maximum drawdown, uh, we can see it does pretty well. The sharp ratio out of sample is above two typically, uh, especially after we exclude the small stocks. Bigger than Q10 means we're excluding the bottom 10%. Uh, based on uh, market cap. Um, those are typically uh, illiquid, hard to trade. They turned out to be drivers of many of the earlier anomalies or even earlier machine learning strategies. But uh, alpha portfolio is robust to that. Now, if we control for various risk factors, uh, here I list, you know, CAPM all the way through uh, Ho Xie Zhang four factor uh, model, the um, alpha is still very significant. Okay. We also, uh, look into where the out performance is coming from. Uh, here I'm just on the left panel, I'm just comparing it to the uh, uh, Freiburger co-author uh, paper using non-parametric approach. Um, that's uh, one of the best performing machine learning uh, uh, strategies uh, in, in recent years. And NP stands for non-parametric, AP stands for alpha portfolio. You can see uh, NP also performs very well. But then once we take out the smaller stocks, uh, the performance tend to drop quite a bit. Uh, alpha portfolio is not suffering from that. This, this is not meant to be a critique to these other papers. These other papers have a different goal. The goal is to figure out uh, what's the right uh, stochastic discount factor we should have. Can we have a low dimensional representation of SDF? Um, can we uh, estimate risk premium more accurately? That's not our goal. Our goal is to maximize portfolio performance, okay? And the right-hand side is, suppose I use a different model. So, well, suppose I use transformer encoder, but I do it in two steps. I estimate SI returns, and then construct portfolio using equal value weighted. It still outperforms many uh, traditional uh, strategies, but um, we can see reinforcement learning. The dynamic one, one, uh, one step direct optimization is contributing to the outperformance. Um, this is the time trend for sharp ratio, the red line here, and uh, the excess alpha over time. Uh, it fluctuates. Some anomalies uh, or some signals uh, might be traded away, but overall, it's still uh, statistically and economically significant. Um, the, the performance is not driven by the particular time period we look at. Uh, no particular industry is driving the performance either. It's not coming from short lag of the portfolio. Um, when we include transaction costs, it's still uh, yielding similar performance. Now we can put uh, in a few other economic restrictions, such as excluding the unrated or downgraded stocks um, because they are hard to trade. They might be going through some corporate events. Um, and uh, uh, Avramov and co-authors have a recent paper uh, looking at machine learning strategies, how they might be affected by imposing these economic restrictions. And here we do see the performance drop quite a bit, but still very significant. Um, and the drop is mainly coming from the fact that in the training sample, we didn't really exclude, we didn't train the model excluding, you know, downgraded or unrated stocks. Okay, so, so that's not too surprising uh, to us. This is how the model performs under different market con condition, different sentiment periods, VIX, uh, market uh, liquidity. Um, it's not driven by you know, crisis episodes where we have high sentiment, or low liquidity. Um, 
during regular times is giving similar performance. So let me just touch on this uh, economic distillation a little bit, and then I probably have to wrap up. So now the model works, seems. Um, and again, it's not about a specific uh, setup of the model. It's really this uh, approach, reinforcement learning, uh, direct optimization approach. Now, um, how can we interpret the model? Without a good understanding, we can't rely on it. It's just uh, another uh, paper pulling machine learning packages. Uh, that's not what we want. We want to interpret the model. How do we do it? Well, we first figure out uh, uh, important features in the model based on how they contribute to the objective that we are optimizing. And once we have the features, we add their second order term, we add their interaction terms. You can do it for different uh, degrees for the polynomial. Then we go back to a linear model. And, and if you are uh, happy with too many variables, we can do a uh, variable selection. So this is different uh, features, uh, how important they are over time for uh, Alpha Portfolio's performance. Uh, let me tell you what these uh, uh, symbols are. Basically, it turns out that the profit margin is very important. Cash holding, the inventory change turns out to be the most important feature. And the inventory change squared, that's also an important term. We didn't really capture interaction terms in that regard. There's also rotation patterns. Uh, you know, uh, financial variables and market trading variables tend to rotate in and out over time. Um, and, and these are things that uh, we can explore further to gain some interpretation. And finally, we also project this onto the firm's filings. When firms take long positions, uh, the, the firm's filings uh, are typically talking about loss cutting profitability. And when firms are, when alpha portfolio is taking short positions in the asset, the assets tend to uh, discuss real estate, corporate events, mistake, recent mistakes. And uh, I don't have time to go uh, into more detail, but this is uh, a first uh, text-based interpretation of AI and machine learning models that I think uh, offers some promise to develop narratives. It's not going to be causal identification, um, but, but it's an initial step towards uh, interpretable uh, AI in, in social sciences. Um, so that's pretty much what I have. Um, Basically, uh, we want to provide this uh, illustration of the utility of reinforcement learning. It's really a different paradigm compared to supervised versus unsupervised learning. And we have to make sure it's economically motivated by financial data, uh, the nature uh, uh, or the gen data generating process. Um, and we also want to be able to understand what the model is doing. And for that, we need this procedure, so economic distillation. Uh, and the procedures are quite extendable. It doesn't have to be uh, portfolio management. Okay, so uh, with that, I'm uh, going to conclude here. Um, what, we, what did we do? Well, in terms of economic approach to portfolio management, we take a direct uh, optimization approach, acknowledging the complex environment that we face. Um, and uh, we also illustrate the efficacy of uh, AI and machine learning applications. The key is really to make them tailored for our particular economic application. And finally, we provide this uh, uh, procedure for interpreting AI or machine learning models. This is a uh, you know, interdisciplinary emerging area. Uh, I personally find it very exciting, uh, also working with computer scientists, you know, very different perspectives. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, I'm, I'm just going to uh, conclude here and uh, happy to take uh, some questions. Hey, thank you so much, Will. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, we have one question from Karen Pfeiffer, or Pfeiffer, I think it's Pfeiffer. Um, and um, the question is, uh, I'm curious about the model's heavy reliance on inventory changes. Do you have a good interpretation for that? Is it maybe some kind of orthogonality to the typical factor that makes uh, the performance so good? Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. Uh, I'm, ha I'm happy to go into more detail offline as well. So regarding the inventory changes, inventory change scale by total assets, it turns out to be a anomaly identified in an accounting paper in 2001. Uh, it didn't garner too much attention, but there are economic channels where uh, you know, it's related to uh, certain uh, accounting reporting issues um, that could lead to uh, you know, firms being underpriced or overpriced. 
So uh, that's one way that we can go deeper to really figure out what's going on economically. But an initial step that we want to do is just to be able to identify them and see which ones are more important. Okay, I actually have a question related to the application to robot advising. I know you didn't touch on it, but like, is your idea would be simply that uh, you would imagine uh, kind of individuals setting their preferences and then the algorithm constructing optimal portfolio locations for whatever their preferences are? Yeah, so, so there are actually two kind of directions related to what, what you mentioned. One is, can we use uh, reinforcement learning to figure out their preference? There are reverse reinforcement learning approaches to figure out based on their dynamic action to figure out how their preferences are changing and evolving. That's one aspect. The other aspect is really, you know, they might have dynamic budget constraints, right? If I make more return today, I have a bigger opportunity set because shorting, I need to put in, I need to put some capital with the brokerage and all that. Um, so that is something dynamic programming can easily incorporate. Whereas the traditional two-step approach is a little bit hard to, uh, Incorporate. So that's where reinforcement learning could be, uh, could hold some promise for robot advising. And, and honestly, we're at the robot advising 1.0, and you're you the expert, so there's <laughs> a big uh, room for uh, for the development in that regard. Yeah, I think uh, I mean you. I think you probably have it in your paper where you, um, or maybe I think it's. Uh, uh, I don't remember, but so I think that, yeah, robot advising is really at the stage of the rotary phone right now, right? So it's still uh, kind of uh, very, very non-sophisticated. In many cases, the applications can be improved dramatically. But yeah, we have a couple of more questions. I'm going to ask you one, and then you can maybe answer the other questions yes. uh, through the chat so that we can move on. Um, so uh, I think Charu Agarwal is asking, is it correct to say that machine learning models helps to select the significant factors from the whole range of possible factors? Um, yes and no. Yes, in the sense that it, it does perform very well. So some features must have played a bigger role in there, but by machine learning packages themselves, it's a complete, almost complete black box. It's really hard to know which one is more important. Occasionally we can identify, oh, these are the important features because based on the gradient numerical optimization, they tend to contribute more. But we still don't know, are they contributing in a nonlinear way? Uh, are they contributing in interaction with other features? And I think that space is wide open. Computer scientists are doing some uh, uh, cross-sectional plots uh, just to see you know, how they are contributing. But I think uh, just coming back to what we all understand, linear models, variable selections, is one uh, seems a reasonable approach in that regard. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Will, for the representation. I think you have more questions coming in, but I think you can take them uh, through the chat. Let's uh, move on to the second uh, presenter, Svetlana. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Svetlana, are you there? I don't think we see you. And I think you're muted. Oh, perfect. Hello? Now we can see it and we can hear you. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Thank you so much, Vedana. You have uh, 20, 25 minutes for the presentation and you can take it away. All right. Um, thank you so much for putting the paper on the program. So this is uh, a joint work with Marcos Belger and Jason Zhu, both from Stanford. And if I'm not mistaken, Marcos is actually with us today. So uh, he can also help with some of the questions that have been asked in the chat, for example, during the talk. Okay. Let's start. Many, if not most, empirical applications and asset pricing have essentially two ingredients. There are test assets, which are usually a set of portfolios, and then there is the model that tries to explain why their expected returns are different from each other. Over the years, we have largely been focusing on the model side. In particular, we found a lot of new factors and built hundreds of nonlinear structural models. However, there was surprisingly little attention to the left-hand side of this equation. But the outcome of the test is essentially going to be only as accurate as informative is the data that is used for it. And so many factories themselves are also built from exactly the same sourcing based portfolios that are being used as a test assets. But why is that the case? Maybe all these years we have been focusing on the wrong object to begin with. So this is essentially was the start of our paper. And in this work, we are trying to build a cross-section of portfolios that efficiently reflects the information contained in a given set of characteristics. 
In other words, we project SDF on the characteristic space and find a small number of interpretable base assets that really represent it well. How do we construct these base assets? Our portfolios and are going to be uh, um, based from the conditional portfolio splits. So we call them AP trees because they come from the decision trees with uh, characteristics driving the construction of a particular test asset. Then we use an economically motivated procedure to prune them, that is to select a small set of potentially overlapping portfolios based on different splits and their depths. The outcome of this procedure is a cross-section of test assets that are easy to interpret. That is, we're going to know exactly what kind of stocks go inside each portfolio at every point of time and why they end up there. This approach allows us to study the impact of non-linearities and interactions without having to formally model them, and it massively alleviates the curse of dimensionality. For example, I will show you a cross-section of 20 or 30 uh, base, uh, base assets, which are going to be reflecting 10 characteristics at the same time. Yet, despite having only 20 or 30 portfolios, this cross-section is going to be several times more informative than stacking 100 individual deciles sorted uh, together in one giant cross-section. Our test assets have high out-of-sample sharp ratios and alphas, on average 30% higher, and the more characteristics are involved, the better they are going to behave relative to the alternative. They are not spanned by the usual long shot factors and obviously pose a much higher bar for existing models. Finally, you can easily customize the procedure to include various constraints, for example, on liquidity, number of portfolios, and the rest. So, um, one thing that often kind of emerges is the question is why do we still use portfolios? Let's say why not individual stocks? Unlike individual stocks, for example, our test assets are going to be balanced. They're going to be relatively stable in their risk exposure, so you could easily use them with structural models and GMM. If you want to get a small test of uh, portfolios, test assets that reflect only some characteristics but not all, you can easily do that. If you want to have a smaller or larger number of portfolios because you're estimating a smaller or larger, larger type of model with larger number of parameters, for example, Again, you can easily do that. That is going to be part of our setting. Unlike latent factor models, or for example, different SDFs that are directly based on reflecting characteristics, our portfolios are going to be fully interpretable. And they're going to be easy to use with both tradable and non-tradable factors, either reduced form or structural nonlinear models. So basically, it's a kind of a general solution to the problem. Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip the literature review. And one of the reasons is because there have been, of course, uh, a large number of effort from uh, people, for both from traditional empirical asset pricing literature and more recently machine learning approach that try to use efficiently the information contained in either macro data or stock specific characteristics to um, kind of uh, figure out what is the data generating process that describes uh, financial returns. However, um, we are going to be looking directly at one question that we think has been largely overlooked in the previous papers, which is exactly the cross-section of portfolios, the selection of the base assets. So, what have people largely been doing up until now? People have been using sorting. And here is an example of a cross-section consisting of 16 double-sorted portfolios based on size and value. Just so that we're all on the same page, um, I'm going to explain how it is constructed. We first sort all the stocks into four equally spaced groups based on their size. And here you can see bottom and top 25% of the stocks. In a similar way, we can sort them uh, based by book to market or value. So the intersection of these assets then is going to form 16 double sorted portfolios. However, it is also immediately clear why this approach leaves much to be desired. There is a massive curse of dimensionality. With three characteristics, you're essentially already going to be running out of stocks. Why did we use four splits, resulting in 16 portfolios with two characteristics? Why not 25 or 50 or 75 or whatever is your favorite number? Why they have to be equally spaced? Maybe we should keep everything in the middle as, for example, one big asset, let's call it more or less market, and then add some splits in particular taste. After all, we do know that most of the anomalies are concentrated towards the end of the cross-sectional distribution of stocks. 
how to efficiently reflect the in impact of nonlinearities and interactions among these characteristics. So all of these issues led us to rethink existing approach. And while our solution, of course, will have its limitations, we hope that it's definitely going to start the uh, much needed discussion. A simple generalization we propose in this paper relies on decision trees or conditional source, conditional splits to form portfolios. Here is an example of one such tree. It starts with all the stocks being divided 50-50 into two big groups based on size. And then each of these portfolios could be sorted, uh, say, by value, and then, for example, by size again. As a result, we get a tree of depth three based on two characteristics. By nature of these conditional splits, we will never end up with empty portfolios. Focusing on the conditional splits here is also important because it allows us to look at the joint distribution of characteristics and study its full impact on stocks, which is actually crucial because of two fundamental reasons. First, most characteristics are dependent. And this dependency structure is not linear and is often hard to capture by, for example, just correlation alone. Conditional splits implicitly take it into account and create balanced buckets of securities. Since characteristics are generally dependent, the order of the splits will matter as well. For example, the left panel shows you the average firm distribution in terms of market cap and book to market ratio, so size and value. And just looking at it, it is immediately clear that if I first sort by size and then by value, or by value and then by size, it will give me very different portfolios. And this is actually true for almost all of the variables we have looked at, almost all of the firm specific characteristics. And this also matters because the characteristics have a very rich conditional impact on asset returns. Here is a textbook example of, again, size and value. Obviously, an average high book-to-market firm tends to have a higher rate of return than its growth counterpart, which is the purple line um, on the graph. However, this effect is almost absent in large caps, and it is particularly strong in the small caps. There are many other examples where once some form of conditioning is taken into account, for example, based on accruals or asset turnover, the effect is going to change in magnitude, shape, or even sign compared to its unconditional counterpart. So it's really important to understand these type of complicated interactions as well. So let us consider our favorite cross-section based on size and value, which is probably the most popular set of best assets used in the empirical literature. How would the tree-based portfolios look like in that case? It will probably look something like this, where depending on the firm distribution and their effect, you could have more granular splits in some areas rather than others. And I suspect, I suspect that some of you are smiling at the moment, both because they actually recognize this picture, they have seen me actually making this joke at, for example, Cavalcade or some other conference, because what you're looking at is the painting from the uh, Museum of Modern Art in, in New York. But the reality is actually not that far from what you see on this painting. On the right panel, you see the familiar 16 double sorted portfolios based on size and value in the space of cross-sectional quantiles, so going from zero to one. On the left, I'm plotting all the portfolios that could be created with trees, both final and intermediate nodes. I'm limiting their depth so that each of them includes no less than one sixteenth of all the stocks, so they could be on equal footing with what we get with double sorts. Note how really interesting and complex could be the return generating process captured by the portfolios on the left and how much we could be missing with the usual sorts, which are shown on the right. You will also know that I have, for example, relatively few splits in some areas of this picture, in particular in the southwest corner. And this is because there are simply very few stocks that are low on both size and value. And so the trees endogenously take that into account. This is something which is well known for practitioners, for example, mutual fund managers, because there is almost no mutual funds that are actually holding the uh, bottom 20% of the stocks uh, um, sorted by value. They are simply too small. Of course, using all the final and intermediate nodes from all the possible trees with a fixed depth is not really feasible for empirical analysis. There are simply too many possible portfolios. So we need to find a way to select those which are really key, those basis assets. 
And this is the process we refer to as pruning. How does pruning usually work? In the standard application of decision trees or random forest, people tend to use the bottom-up approach. So for example, consider um, the set of these three nodes. So usually one could try to compare, let's say the return on the bottom two portfolios, and if they're different enough, you keep them separate, you do the split. If not, you merge them into the parent node. But this approach is clearly not going to work for our setting. Because remember, our goal is to select blocks for the SDF, the best set of basis assets. That means that together, that should contain as much information as possible that should then form an SDF with the highest sharp ratio. If I were to use portfolio logic to this process of pruning or selecting the portfolios, the question at hand is whether I assign the same weight or not to these two child nodes in my overall asset allocation. And clearly, the answer to that question depends not only on returns, but also on variances and covariances of these portfolios, not only between each other, but also with all the other assets that I have at my disposal. And this implies that pruning based on some one-dimensional local characteristic cannot really be done here. Choosing the right set of portfolios that really span and form the SDF is a global optimization problem. And this is why usual techniques from random forest and decision trees are going to be really good, let's say, for just return prediction. But they are probably not the right tool if you want to understand the building blocks for the SDF. We have to solve a global optimization problem. But as with any global optimization problem with a really large set of variables, of course, it is going to benefit immensely from different way of shrinkage. So we take all the final and intermediate nodes from all the possible trees with a given depth and construct an efficient portfolio frontier. You will notice that there are essentially three tuning parameters here. There is the target return for my portfolio. There is the lasso shrinkage bit lambda one, and then that can be used to control how many portfolios we want to end up with. For example, select 10, 20, or 50. And then there is the reach part, that's the lambda two. So that is needed to stabilize the variance and portfolio weights within the overall SDF. As a result, we can select the best robust set of basis assets from both the final and intermediate nodes. That is kind of very narrow, less diversified, and very wide, more diversified portfolios that form the SDF. And this is another aspect in which we differ from the standard pruning of the trees. In the end, we're going to retain only particular nodes colored in red in this picture, not all the portfolios along the whole tree path. In the paper, um, we study the properties of this procedure. And in particular, we can show that one can think of this optimization as actually building a robust mean variance portfolio from the point of view of an investor who is very ambiguity averse. That is, it simply doesn't trust the numbers from the in-sample parameter estimates due to their instability and would really like to protect herself against the worst possible case within a certain range of parameters. And it turns out that the optimal portfolio allocation under this estimation uncertainty and sharp ratio, expected returns, and their variances is actually going to coincide with our problem one to one. While the lasso and reach penalties are well known in the finance literature, and in particular due to the recent work by, for example, Sergei Kozak and uh, Victor de Miguel, whose papers also have been cited actually by the uh, previous uh, speaker. Um, it is the use of the target return as a tuning parameter that I would really like to comment on. When you vary the target rate of return for your portfolio, what you're really doing is moving along the portfolio frontier between the tangency portfolio and the minimum variance one. In other words, you're going to be shrinking expected returns towards their cross-sectional mean. Why is this important? This is important because there is massive estimation error in expected returns. When you consider a set of 25 or 50 portfolios and choose how much to invest in each of them, it's very likely that the asset with the highest rate of return in sample actually got there simply by chance, just because it's the best out of 50. So if you were to use this usual in sample estimate, you would overweight it relative to its fair value. 
And this is where shrinkage to the cross-sectional mean really helps. Of course, the optimal degree of it is going to depend on a particular set of assets. And one sample analog of this procedure is very well known to all of you, I'm sure. Um, this is the so-called adjusted betas, which are published by Bloomberg, because it, they are also being shrunk towards their cross-sectional average, which is one. And you can see for almost all of the tradable securities like stocks, where they have the actual estimated beta coming from the data and the adjusted one, which applies shrinkage to the mean. And here is a final illustration of how pruning could work empirically. So instead of splitting all the stocks into, let's say, eight equally distanced portfolios, you could actually end up with just five um, uh, as a result of this pruning procedure, with one of them being the market, the second including half of all the stocks, or maybe a quarter, and then maybe only one of them going really into the tail, into one eighth of the stocks. So you could end up with portfolios actually more diversified than the standard sorts to begin with. And it really all depends on the data. The selection between both final and intermediate nodes allows us to understand how granular one should actually go with these splits in the portfolio. Now, let's look at some of the empirics. Our data is gonna be standard. So we're looking at monthly returns and some of the most famous characteristics used in the previous literature. And in particular, I'm going to take a list of 10 characteristics why? Because these are the characteristics that have been used to construct portfolios available from Ken French website. So those that everybody essentially is using in academic research. The standard application and familiarity would also help us to establish natural basis for comparison. Um, we are going to be a focus on the properties of 36 cross sections. So each of them is going to be based on using size and two other characteristics. Why do we always include size? Again, because this is exactly how portfolios are constructed. Those available from Ken French website. So again, this is a natural benchmark for comparison. We will use the same portfolio approach to different assets. So all of the results that you're going to see, all of these different properties of cross sections based on double or triple sorting versus trees or conditional sorts, all of them are going to be coming really from trees versus standard sorting based approach. So it is important to know that all of our empirics is going to be done out of sample. We're going to use the first 20 years of data to estimate model parameters. We're going to use the next 10 years to find the optimal tuning parameters, such as the degree of, for example, shrinkage for each of the cross sections. So they're going to be cross section specific. And then we fix that selection, portfolio weights, and just let the data speak, let the model run for the next 23 years. All of our portfolios are going to be evaluated. And we specifically are going to exclude extreme uh, sorted um, uh, portfolios. So for example, whenever you're using the same characteristics four times. In fact, our results would have been even better if we were to use them in our analysis, but we just wanted to be completely fair with the triple sorts and double sorts, because it is impossible to achieve that degree of granularity using triple sorted portfolios. And so we wanted to kind of have these two methods to be completely on equal footing. So actually, if you relax this condition, uh, you would see that trees perform even better. On the triple sorts and sides, we're going to be using the cross sections of 32 or 64 triple sorted portfolios, which correspond to using either one or two cuts based on size. OK, so here are the monthly out of sample sharp ratios that could be achieved by combining an optimal set of tree based portfolios together relative to that of triple sorts. For the sake of comparison, we are here retaining 40 tree-based portfolios for each of the cross-section. And I will comment on this choice a little bit later. In this graph, I'm sorting all the cross-sections by the sharp ratio that is achieved with the trees. And it is clearly much higher than the alternative. But sharp ratio could, of course, come from either high loadings on some sources of risk, which come with a reward, or it could come from actually alphas, something which is not spanned by traditional risk factors. And as we show in the paper, to a large extent, they're actually coming from the alphas. These SDF alphas, again, specific to each of the cross sections, are not spanned by Fama French three or five factor models. It doesn't help if you use cross section specific factors 
So um, it illustrated by this picture where, for example, you always include momentum factor or whatever. Momentum has been used as one of the characteristics to construct strategies and portfolios. No changes if we're actually going to be include all 10 long short factors in addition to the market to try to explain the performance of the strategies. Naturally, um, conventional models also going to have a hard time pricing these portfolios within each of these cross-sections. While conventional cross-section specific long short factors have no problem achieving an R-square of something like 85 or 90 percent on triple sorts, even 64 uh, portfolios of triple sorts, their ability to explain our base assets is going to be much worse. And in some cases, you can get only as much as 40 percent of the R-square. So to be honest, triple sorted portfolios, again, even as many as 64, are actually quite easy to price. Let's look at the particular cross-section to get a better sense of what is going on. Here are portfolios sorted by size, investment, and operating profitability. And in this particular case, there are almost no need to use reach. There are also some moderate shrinkage towards the cross-sectional mean that was just like 15%. So the left panel is going to show you the sharp ratio as a function of the portfolio numbers, those that we retain from the whole set of trees which is then used to select the optimal value, right? And before, we just set the equal to 40 for almost all of the cross-sections. But as you can see, actually almost all of the information is contained in just 10 portfolios. So if you use just 10 basis assets, that's already enough to get like 90% of alphas and sharp ratios and everything else. And this turns out to be a very stable result across all of the cross-sections. We see essentially the same picture out of sample for almost all of them. This feature of the data is extremely robust. You don't need a lot of portfolios to reflect data well. What you need is to just choose the right ones. And here are some of the summary statistics where I'm highlighting the um, properties of the cross-section based on 10 tree-based portfolios. As you can see, they have higher sharp ratio, not massively, but then again, it's just a representative example. They have more pronounced alphas, and they have really low cross-sectional R-square compared to triple sorts. Your factors, it's very easy to get an R-square of 90%. A much better measure would be looking at the sharp ratio, which is achievable out of sample, or how much the data is actually spanned by your factors, kind of like an out of sample GRS, which is exactly what we do here. We don't think that our results are driven by microcaps. We have done the same analysis by cutting out um, uh, different types of data to kind of safeguard against this, which is, by the way, again, very easy to do when you're working with trees. So, for example, panel B shows you what happens if we include only stocks with a market cap above 0.01 percent that of the market. Just to give you a, a kind of as a side comment, right now there are only about 60, um, 600 stocks that are going to satisfy this requirement. So these are really, really large caps. This is almost just S&P 500. And we still get high sharp ratios, significant alphas, and lower fit from the standard models. In a paper, we also did a bunch of other robustness checks, uh, experimenting with various cutoffs, rebalancing frequencies. We looked at the time variation. Base asset selection is always very stable, even though the weights within the SDF could, for example, change over time, depending on expected returns and volatilities. And the last picture that I really want to show you is essentially the structure of the SDF in the portfolio and the characteristic space. While some of these patterns are going to be similar across trees and triple sorts, others are going to be very different. For example, the whole set of stocks with high investment are going to be basically um, endogenously treated as one big portfolio. And you should be buying not just small caps, but actually large ones as well. And it really feels like this picture kind of illustrates the strengths of our approach. Information contained in the conditional distribution of firms and the characteristic impact matters for decision making because it affects both kind of the return aspect, but the risk, the volatility aspect as well. And I think at this point, we're only starting to understand how that translates to risk loadings and returns. But triple sorts are for sure are just too coarse for addressing this type of problems. Finally, just as a very quick side note, I want to show examples of portfolios which are based on 10 characteristics at the same time. 
And here at the bottom, you see the green uh, and the blue lines. So these are going to be, for example, various combinations of best sell sorted portfolios based on 10 characteristics. So you start with like 100 decile sorted portfolios, which usually is assumed to be a really challenging uh, thing to price. It is not. Out of sample, that type of test assets achieves maybe 30% of the sharp ratio that you can actually get if you were to use tree-based portfolios. So using decile sorted portfolios and pricing them is actually quite easy, and you're going to miss out a lot of the information which is contained in the returns. In fact, it is enough to have, again, a small number of assets, but rightfully chosen number of assets in order to get almost all of these results. Okay. Um, I would really like to finish this talk by um, kind of uh, talking a little bit about the overall role of machine learning in finance. And so recently there have been some people kind of getting skeptical about the potential. And the reason it happens is because there are essentially two types of problems that we are facing. And I think Will also has been talking about them um, in his previous talk. Um, there is the simple prediction, say returns or risk premia as an unknown function of some variables. And this is where standard machine learning typically really, really shines. It is designed to work there. However, our ultimate goal in many applications is going to involve prediction output that is then used for other problems, for building portfolios, for finding SDF, for getting accurate estimates of some structural parameters. And what works best for the standalone prediction is not necessarily what's actually going to give you the best answer to all these other questions. And so this is why off-the-shelf statistical tools and machine learning tools sometimes can be quite disappointing. It is very important to keep the economics inside the modern data techniques. And then I think we'll be able to do a lot more in different areas of economics and finance. And there is so much potential in these tools that we are just starting to understand. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Svetlana, for the fantastic uh, presentation. Do we are a little bit behind, uh, but do we have uh, uh, any question for Svetlana? We've before we move on to Leah. And you know, if questions come up a little bit later, you can always write them in the chat. So there is uh, always that option as well. Going for once, twice. Okay, well then let's move now to uh, Leah, who's going to present uh, the paper selecting directors using machine learning. Leah, you have uh, 20 to 25 minutes. All right. Can you hear me? Everything okay in terms of logistics? Okay, perfect. perfect. So thank you very much, Alberto, and all of the organizers for putting together, uh, you know, this machine learning day. This is this is great, and thank you for inviting us to to um, talk about our, our paper, our, our research. So this is joint work with Ijul Al Chen Houghton and Mike Weisbach. and Ijul and Mike are actually in the audience uh, today. So they're with us today. And so uh, the question of selecting directors is a long-standing question in corporate governance. And so what we're really interested in in this paper is understanding the decision-making process that goes into uh, selecting directors. Oops, let me see here. Um, and so we've known uh, since Adam Smith here, since Adam Smith and Berlin Mintz, that we can expect this process to be filled with agency issues. And the reason is because CEOs uh, are typically those that are, uh, you know, de facto in charge of the nomination process for directors. And the thing is that CEOs today have just as much control over who gets a seat at the table as they did back then, right? And when I say back then, you can take your pick 1776 or 1932, uh, it's pretty much the same. So really things have not changed much, right? CEOs are, are still in charge. Uh, of that process. What has changed though uh, is technology. And so what we do in this paper is we're going to use the predictive power of machine learning techniques uh, to help make some progress in this central area in corporate governance. Okay, so visually here's what we do. Okay, so suppose that this is the current board. And the company, so the firm, has a board seat, an empty seat to be filled here and what we're going to do in the paper, so to visualize what we do is we're going to employ supervised machine learning algorithms to generate predictions for us 
for how potential directors would perform on this specific board for this company. So we're going to be taking into account who's currently sitting on the board and what kind of company it is. And the idea is going to be to compare the director that was in the end, that was eventually selected by the board and by the CEO, right? To the directors that the algorithm would have recommended for this board position. And by the way, those faces are actually not real. They were AI generated, so I can use them in my slides. Um, okay. So, so this is this is the idea of the paper. So, why do we use machine learning in the in this paper? So, what's the point? So, the reason we use machine learning is we think that the problem of hiring directors uh, is essentially a prediction problem, right? So, boards have to make some kind of prediction for how they think a particular candidate is in the end going to perform. And machine learning techniques are simply superior uh, to traditional econometrics when it comes to predictions, to add a sample predictions. And there are a number of reasons for this. Uh, you know, the, the, the big one is that they're, well, they're designed to maximize add a sample predictive accuracy uh, by avoiding overfitting, for example, and by not being constrained uh, by a specific uh, parametric assumptions or functional form or by being restrained uh, in the number of covariates that they can use. Um, and so the reason why we really need, why we really want accurate predictions in our exercise is because we want to use those predictions. So the, the prediction is not the end exercise here. We want to use those predictions because we want to uh, use them to compare the performance of algorithm versus management selected uh, directors. And we think that this is going to allow us to have something to say about the quality of uh, director hiring decisions. And we can also use those predictions to look not at the performance, but at the attributes of algorithm versus management selected directors. And that's going to uh, uh, speak to the features uh, that are overrated or underrated uh, in the, in the um, uh, process for selecting directors. Okay, so what do we mean by director performance? So, <laughs> In any algorithm design, a really key component, really, what's really crucial is the choice of the label. This is absolutely crucial. So what are you asking your algorithm to predict? And so this is something we've really given a lot of thought and it's actually not simple. The reason why it's not simple is because the board acts behind closed door and the only thing that we observe is the collective action, right? So the board acts as a group, it makes those really important decisions such as hiring or firing the CEO or approving a merger bid, uh, but we only observe the outcome as a, as a group. But what we really need uh, is an individual measure of, of performance. And so to guide us in our search for a good measure, a good metric to measure director performance, we go back to the mandate of the board. And uh, we share the view in Hart and Zingales that directors' fiduciary duty is actually to represent uh, uh, shareholders' interests. And that means that the decision-making process for hiring a director, well, it should involve some kind of prediction for how he or she is going to fulfill that, that mandate, right? So we really would like our measure of director performance uh, to be tied to how well she's going to represent shareholders' interests. And so that's why we're going to use the level of shareholder support. It seems to be a really natural metric for director performance when we go back to what the mandate of the board actually is. Uh, and that's what we're going to use as our main measure. Uh, to be more precise, we're going to use excess votes. So we're going to use total votes or at annual director uh, re-elections. And we're going to subtract the average that other board members that were who were up for re-election that same year, um, the average for the board. And so we end up with a market-based uh, individual measure of uh, director performance. And so we know from the literature on director elections that there's typically really no surprise in terms of uh, the outcome of those elections. Directors get reelected pretty much no matter what, there's no surprise in the outcome. And they typically gather really, really strong support. So I think the average across studies is around 95%, and that's also what we find here. Uh, what's interesting is that in the recent literature on director elections, so even though there's no surprise in the outcome, the variation in the total votes does matter. And the variation really does reflect market perceptions of director quality. 
So, for example, Fisher et al. find that the level of shareholder support predicts stock price reactions to subsequent CEO turnover. Uh, Kai Gordon and Wackling find that low support for directors leads to more CEO turnover and more actions to improve corporate governance down the road. And Rina and, and co-authors uh, find that receiving low support, uh, you know, low shareholder support has really negative consequences for directors. So again, even though there's you know, rarely any surprise in the re-election outcome, the level of support really does contain meaningful information. So our paper is related to that literature. It's also related to the um, uh, new literature uh, or emerging literature that uses, but, but is growing quickly, uh, in machine learning in econ or finance. And there are a multitude of, of, of new papers and I simply here listed uh, some of what I think are seminal papers. Um, it's also related uh, to the older literature on discretion versus algorithms, uh, which recently received uh, renewed attention because of the, the advancements in machine learning. So one of the reasons that may not seem obvious for why we really like our measure of, of performance, so using shareholder votes as our measure of performance, is that it somehow mitigates uh, the concern, the potential concern, that the algorithm might act as a bias propagator. So you may have heard, you know, the concern that that's, you know we hear you may have read about this in the popular press or in like in, in various serious uh, um, uh, journals that algorithms may replicate our worst biases as human beings, and this is actually a real concern. Uh, so I'm not downplaying the concern, but here our measure of performance. Um, kind of helps in that regard because we have the decision maker and the evaluator who are distinct entities, right? So what we really wouldn't want, for example, is we wouldn't want uh, those who select a candidate also be the ones who stem their performance as either good or bad, right? So for example, uh, a, no, not, a not so good measure of, of director performance would be promotions on the board, right? This would, this would be uh, horrible in terms of replicating biases. So here we have the board who, that includes the CEO, select the directors, generate our right-hand side variables, and then we have shareholders, separate entity, um, that generate our left-hand side variables. Okay, so in terms of data, we have roughly 25,000 new directors uh, who are appointed over a 15-year period, so between 2000 and 2014. Um, so if we have the shareholder support data for these 25,000 uh, directors. We're going to split uh, this data into the, a training set and a test set. So the training set is going to, um, um, to be comprised of directors appointed uh, in the first 12 years of our sample period. And then the test set is going to, to, to use the last three years of director appointments. And we, make, we, we split the training and test set this way to avoid uh, feeding a model to predict director performance using directors that are going to be appointed uh, in the future. So we don't want to do that. Um, and so we, the predictions that we make you know, are, are ex anti predictions. So we're being very careful not uh, to give the algorithm any information that the nominating committee would not have at the time uh, of the decision. And so for a vector of inputs, again, we use a bunch of firm board and director level characteristics. Um, um, that we give to the algorithm to, to generate the predictions. And again, our outcome variable, uh, the, main, the main level is this excess shareholder support measure. Uh, we also um, do the same exercise using uh, total support, so without uh, subtracting the average for the state of directors, and we find you know, very similar, the same conclusion. We also run some robustness using firm profitability uh, and cars. Okay. So what we do in this table is we simply report the fraction of new directors, so in our test set, the fraction of new directors that receive much lower support uh, than other directors on the board. And we break it down by characteristic. So uh, overall, this is considering roughly the bottom 10% of new directors. Uh, but you can see that it varies quite a bit uh, by some director and, and board level uh, features. So, for example, we have uh, um, about 11% of new directors who are male that receive this low support, this bad outcome. Uh, and that, that number is 8% is for women. And if you go down the table a little bit, you see that for busy directors, it's 14.5%. 14, 14 so 14.5% of new directors who are busy 
So they sit on three or more board, they receive this really bad outcome, but it's only 9% for directors that are not busy. So it does, this suggests that there are some characteristics that are associated with lower shareholder support. The thing is, it's really hard to know uh, which functional form of which attribute is going to lead to good at a sample uh, predictions, right? So the space of couriers that matter is potentially really big and how to combine them to get to arrive at strong at a sample predictive accuracy is just really not clear. So this is a, just simply another way to see why we're turning to supervised machine learning in this case, uh, because those techniques are designed to pick up signal and avoid overfeeding in order to generate um, at a sample predictions. So again, the algorithm is going to use features about the director, uh, but also about who else is currently on the board, features about the firm. It's going to see all of this and, and fit the model for the appointment between uh, 20 and 2011. And then it's going to generate predictions uh, for how directors appointed between uh, 2012 and 2014 are going to perform. So results. So here's one way to show the results. Uh, and you know, the results that I'm going to show you only uh, use data on our test sets. So those, so those are all out of sample predictions. So on the uh, x-axis, you've got predicted performance, and on the y-axis, uh, you have actual performance. And so what we would like for any model that tries to make performance predictions, we would want uh, directors predicted to do poorly to in the end end up doing much worse than those predicted to do well, right? So we want uh, actual performance to be increasing in predicted performance. And what we find, so we try various algorithms that are widely used in the CS community. We find that for all of those machine learning algorithms, that's the case, right? So directors predicted to do poorly, they do end up doing much worse than those predicted to do well. And we also tried to run an OLS model kind of like as, a, as a benchmark, uh, but it's clear that the OLS model has issues with overfitting. And so out of sample, the predictions are just simply not very good. Now, from a governance perspective, we're really interested in knowing more about, I don't know if you can see my mouse here. Uh, we're really interested in, in knowing more about these directors. So directors um, at the bottom of the uh, predicted performance distribution. So in the bucket one and two, right? So we want to know more about these directors because those are directors who predictably received low support from shareholders. Uh, before we can do that though, we need to take a little detour and this is kind of a technical detour that we need to take uh, to ensure that we can trust these predictions. So what this graph here is telling us is that uh, the algorithms do well and they make good predictions in our test set. However, uh, if ultimately the goal is to show that the algorithm can improve on board's decisions, then this is not sufficient to show that it can predict well on the test set. And the reason why is because we can only observe how well the algorithm does on cases for which we see the actual outcome. So for which we have the labels, but this is not a random set. So if boards rely on unobservables in their hiring decisions, then the distribution of outcomes for hired directors can be very different from the distribution of outcomes for those that were not hired, even if they have exactly the same observable features. So in other words, among those with the same observables, who gets a label and who doesn't is not random. And that's the selective labels problem. So a way around this involves designing uh, a pool of potential candidates uh, for each uh, new uh, board seat. So in our test sets, right? So we're gonna ask who else could they have hired but didn't. And so for directors in our test set, uh, we're going to look at other directors that they could have hired. And so those are gonna be directors who around the same time uh, joined the board of a nearby smaller company. And the reason we designed the candidate polls this way is that uh, we're zooming in on candidates who we know were available to join a board at the time. They signaled, right, that by revealed preference that they would have been willing to travel to that location for meetings, and they would have been uh, willing to accept because it typically pays more, it's more prestigious to sit on the board of a larger company. We also run some robust tests around different ways of constructing uh, um, these candidate pools, and we find similar, similar results. Okay, 
So for these candidates, we don't observe how they would have done on the board, right? So that's the essence of the, of the, quasi -lab of, of the selective labels problem. What we do observe is what we call uh, their quasi labels, right? So their performance on the board that they effectively joined. And so we're going to use those quasi labels as an indication for how those possible candidates would have performed on the board, on the, on the focal board. And so here's uh, an illustration of, of that uh, quasi labels procedure. So the first step is we want to rank all hired directors. So again, in our test set, directors that were effectively hired by the focal firms according to their predicted performance. We're going to zoom in at the bottom and say, well, those are candidates that the algorithm, they would have, the algorithm would have flagged them and say, those are predicted uh, uh, to do poorly. And then for these, we asked, well, who else was available, but you know, they didn't hire. And so we're going to, for each of these, we're going to grab the personal candidate pool and look at all of those candidates and rank those candidates according to their predicted performance on the focal board. We're going to focus on uh, the top, also the promising candidates. And for these promising candidates, we're going to uh, rank them uh, according to, uh, to their quasi label. So according to their performance on the board that they effectively joined. And then the question becomes, where does Y? So Y is uh, the actual performance of those directors that were at the bottom here. So directors, the algorithm, find them as the, you know, they, those are going likely to do poorly. Where does Y, so their actual performance, sit in that distribution of quasi labels? And intuitively, if Y ranks high in that distribution, what does that tell us? It tells us that, well, the algorithm, you know, flagged them as potentially poor performers, but when we look around and we see who else was available and how they did, it turns out that those directors actually did pretty well. So whatever and observables the board used in making its hiring decision, you know, was used as signal and was a good call. On the other hand, if Y ranks low in that distribution of quality labels, then this is telling us that those directors were identified as directors who would perform poorly and they indeed turned out to do poorly. So whatever in observables the board, the board used was not signal, but it was noise or it was you know, uh, issues, uh, agency related issues. And so what we find is that if you look on the right hand side of this graph, what we find is that using XGBoost, so one of the uh, algorithms that we use, um, when we look at directors predicted to do poorly, so directors in the first decile of predicted performance, um, the median rank in the distribution of quasi labels is the 27th uh, percentile, so pretty low. And directors predicted to do uh, well, they rank at the 78th percentile. And when we contrast that to the performance, so it looks like OLS just has a really hard time in discriminating ex ante who's going to do well and, and who's not. So in this graph, uh, we see that the rank in the distribution of quasi labels increases across the styles of predicted performance. And, so, and this is when we compare with all potential candidates. Uh, and so what, what this does is it really confirms the validity of the predictions beyond testing uh, performance on the test set and, and, and dealing with the selective labels problem. Okay, so now, you know, obviously the, 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 those quasi labels are not a perfect substitute for labels, right? So we know, we're very aware um, that those, those quasi labels might be inflated because the, the match between the board and the director is an endogenous match, right? But from our perspective and for the exercise that we do here, this is simply a noisier benchmark than the ideal benchmark that we'd like to use. And so what we simply need is we need, that the, we need the distribution of quasi labels generated by candidates in the pool to approximate the distribution that they would have generated had they served on the focal board. So it's really the distribution that matters. And the second assumption that we need is, when, is that the error is not systematically correlated with white hat, with predicted performance. And remember also that those candidate pools and the quasi-label procedure, all of this, we only use it to uh, evaluate the, the predictions from the algorithm uh, in order to deal with the selective labels problem. But in practice, 
you know, the algorithm can still make a prediction for any director um, and, and boards can still rely on, on patterns matching. But we really think that this quasi-labels procedure can be used in other prediction contests uh, in which labels are missing and kind of as a way to go around that selective labels uh, problem, which is pervasive um, if, we, if we want to apply machine learning in social sciences. Okay. So, um, as I said earlier, from a governance uh, perspective, what we're really interested in is understanding, understanding a bit more uh, about those directors that populate the bottom bucket, right? So who are those directors and why were they hired uh, if they were predictably unpopular? So for each characteristic here, we're going to show the mean for directors who were hired, uh, but were predictably bad and the mean for directors the algorithm would have uh, recommended uh, instead. And so what we find is that some overrated features in the director selection process is uh, being male, having a, a large network, having a finance background, and uh, lots of current and, and previous directorship. And an underrated feature is actually the number of qualifications. Okay. So conclu no, conclusion, so maybe I should have said this a little bit earlier, but we're currently uh, actively revising the paper and we have very exciting uh, new results coming soon, so stay tuned. Uh, but to wrap up, what we do in this paper is we use uh, 21st century technical tools to confirm an observation that really dates back over 200 years, uh, namely that the board selection process leads to, this, to directors who often are not necessarily the best choices uh, to serve shareholders' interests. And we strongly believe that predictive algorithms, such as the one we use in the paper, hold promise for improving uh, board's choices of directors and for improving the way in which um, governance serves uh, shareholders' interests. So thank you. Thank you very much, Leah. That's fantastic. Uh, your co-authors already have taken care of uh, some of the questions, but you oh. still have uh, uh, a couple of them. Uh, yes, I think Mike was uh, very, very active. But so we have uh, the first question is from uh, Jikan. Uh, I think Mike didn't have the time to kind of answer this question yet. But he's um, Jikan is asking, how do you know? Oh, so how do you think about considering industry or sectoral fixed effects? Because it may be possible that increasing trends in EBITDA, for example, may um, be higher in certain sectors and specific eras. Right. So we do take that. So um, the algorithm does see which industry the, the companies operate. So there is kind of some, you know, it does take industries into account. Also, uh, we do take industries into account when we uh, do that exercise of looking at other potential candidates who could have been hired. We, um, at some point, we restrict to only candidates, to only other directors who join the board of a, um, uh, a company in the same industry. Right. And so we do take industry into account. That's absolutely, uh, I think, important. Right? Yes. And I think he has a second question, which is um, more technical, is what about, or can you talk a little bit about the hyperparameters that you set for the XG boost? Are you taking like the standard settings yes. uh, that, yes. that the packages so, have, or do you modify that? Yes. Yeah, so that's a good question. So. Um, so we do use uh, the standard, you know, default parameters in XGBoost, and and really, the, I like this question because, um, you know, the the innovation in the paper is really to kind of flip the question of the, of um, um, the quality of bores and uh, on its head, right, and pitch this as a as a prediction problem, and so the innovation is not kind of to come up with absolutely the best algorithm. We kind of, we're a little bit agnostic about which um, algorithm does best or should do best. And so uh, in that sense, we're very, we, we're not trying to, we just say, okay, let's, let's try XGBoost, which you know, is, a, is, a, is a very powerful algorithm. And then, you know, in terms of the hyperparameter, you know, which we, we tried with the, with the default and it works really well. And so we're not kind of trying to, uh, um, but, but so that's also goes back to the idea that we're trying to, the way we view this paper is really as a first pass exercise to kind of show that there are directors who, you know, we can predict that they're not going to do so well. And, um, but again, we're not, we're, you know, I, I'm sure there could be better, as, you know, if you had better data, so privately, you know, obtain data, and if you had a better algorithm, you could make even better predictions, right? That for sure. 
Mm. And I think on, on the flip side, and this is kind of a more curiosity I have. So when you use OLS, do you use just a kitchen sink OLS? Do you put all the regresses in or do you do model selection? Because in many cases, whenever you start using model selection criteria like AIC or BIC, you start seeing that even OLS performs reasonably well in um, this kind of so exercises. We tried, we tried different uh, OLS models, you know, we, and, and it kind of didn't really matter which one. It, it's just, it did well in sample, but other sample did not do so well. Um, but again, like the, you know, I think if OLS had worked well, then that would have, you know, it's, you know, it again, goes back to what is the innovation of the paper is like, if OLS had done well, it's still this productive yeah. exercise, right? Yeah. And, and so, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah but it, you know, it, it, it really did turn out that whatever we tried with OLS, it didn't do well at a sample. It really could not discriminate exactly who's going to end up at the top and who's going to end up at the bottom. And when we considered that quasi labels procedure, it just is horrible. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. We are right on time. It's uh, 1.30. Uh, let me give another couple of seconds in case someone else has uh, any other questions. And um, otherwise, uh, let me just uh, take this opportunity to thank very much uh, the presenters, they all did an amazing job. Thank you, Svetlana, Will, and Leah. Um, once again, we have a, a number of uh, initiatives here at the center, so please make sure to check our website and follow us on Twitter at GUFINPolicy. And um, so just a reminder, we will not have an event next uh, Friday, mainly because uh, MBR is having this household finance uh, sessions that are going to be covering a lot of uh, um, aspects related to FinTech. Uh, so the next event will be on July the 24th. So you will receive an email with all the details uh, over the next couple of weeks. Thank you so much for logging in and have a wonderful weekend. And thank you guys. It was awesome.